So, are you all out of breath? Give it up for Chris. I'm, I'm ready to go, and I have the, I have the privilege of, of um, um, introducing our speaker tonight, but before I do, I want to tell you that the bullhorn works. Okay, so for those of you who are coming Saturday morning, the bullhorn works, and we will use it. Okay. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing about the plant distribution is I want to assure you that I have personally inspected all the plants, <laughs> and they're very, very good looking, I have to say, they high quality. And all the ones that worked in his garden have already been taken and are in his house. <laughs> The bullhorn works. Okay. <laughs> it, is, it is indeed my honor and privilege to introduce our speaker, um, whom I have to confess I just met this evening and find to be a charming gentleman. Um, Tom Cox and his wife Evelyn started the Cox Arboretum in 1990 when they purchased an undeveloped 13-acre parcel in Canton, Georgia. And over the next 24 years, the garden evolved into one of the premier collections of woody tax in the southeastern United States. In 2002 and again in 2014, the Arboretum was selected as one of the host sites for the American Conifer Society's National Meeting and is now a very frequent stop for gardening enthusiasts as well as those involved in serious plant study. And I might add at that point, it took all of what, Tom, 30 seconds for you to invite me to personally come and visit your garden. And for that, I thank you and I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, when the new director shows up. Um, <laughs> Tom is a pioneer, if you will, in the evaluation of conifers for adaptability in the southeast region of the United States and is recognized as one of the leading authorities on growing conifers in this region. The Arboretum is now a site for uh, preservation of rare and endangered conifers from around the world. Tom is a frequent lecturer on the subject of conifers and is also a member of the prestigious International Dendrology Society. He is past president of the American Conifer Society and has been published many times in their journal. Uh, a retired U.S. Army devotes full time now to the collection and evaluation of rare plants with specific focuses on conifers. Tom holds a B.S. degree from New York Institute of Technology and an M.S. degree in psychology from Georgia State University. So please help me as we welcome Tom to the, to the podium to give um, a talk on, guess what? Yeah. Congress. <laughs> Tom? Oh. Wardrobe malfunction, right? Wardrobe malfunction. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure it's my fault, too. <laughs> no, never. Well, thank you, Bryce. No, I heard a guy one time say something I thought was very funny. He said, this was the second best introduction I've ever had. He said, the best introduction I ever had was the time that the guy who was going to introduce me got sick, and I had to introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> so you Sorry use, that. You use that sometime. <laughs> it, is, it is a real honor to be here at this institution. i got to tell you, I, I was so happy when this opportunity came up. I give a lot of talks. Uh, last week I was in Birmingham, which was my hometown. That was quite special to be back where I was born and raised. But to come here to the Ralston, that, uh, as my wife would tell you, this has sort of been the mecca for me. I had the privilege of meeting and knowing not real closely, but I knew J.C. Ralston, Dr. Ralston. And uh, I was telling Bryce, during, during my lifetime, I think that J.C. was the greatest plantsman of that time. And, uh, you know, a lot of what we have at the Arboretum is as a result of what came from here and through his hard work. Well, let me tell you a little bit about uh, how I got started and then give some context to what I'm going to talk about. And, you know, conifers is a subject that you don't hear a lot of people standing up here talking about. Um, I was with Mike Durr the other day, not the name drop, but I was with Mike Durr and Don Shadow the other day at the Southern Plant Conference, and we were talking about conifers being a plant that's been overlooked in the South, and I know Mike didn't do a whole lot in his book when he talked about uh, woody plants, conifers was kind of a minor piece of that. So now I think as you go through nurseries, garden centers, you're seeing more and more of that genre of plants. I'm going to tell you why I think it's a very good reason. So 1990, as Bryce mentioned, 
I got the crazy idea to start an arboretum. I was thinking about what Tony wrote. You know, so you want to start a garden center, I think it is Tony or something like that, but I could write a book, so you want to start an arboretum. And you know, all of the all of the ins and outs of that. But I don't think at that time I knew what a conifer was. I never really thought about it. Uh, the, the winters here always seem longer to me than they are. And we're just north of Atlanta, about 45 miles. You know, the winter compared to north or Denver somewhere, it's a pretty short winter, but I really wanted evergreen interest. Well, that was a holly or a rhododendron or a conifer. Anything I could get my hands on just to give some winter interest. And um, I used to come to a place called Yadkin Valley Nursery. A guy named Rob Means. And Rob, Rob, some of you probably shop there and know this place in Yadkin Valley, North Carolina. Um, we got a lot of things from him. And over time, I made a discovery. These doggone plants are easy to grow, pretty much. And they're interesting. They're botanically interesting. They're <laughs> evolutionarily interesting. I found colors, textures, shapes that is unknown in any other plant group. Those of you that have fooled with these for a while know this. You know, there's a, there's a conifer for every application. And I just fell in love with it. I'm not here tonight to say tear out all your day lilies, throw away all your rhododendrons, throw away all your perennials. Uh, but I am saying that as a plant you can use as a specimen plant in mixed condition with hollies and maples and little dwarf dogwoods. They're great plants. So we use them in a number of ways. So I'm going to get busy here. And I encourage you as I go along to please ask questions. We don't have to save it to the end. If you want to save your question to the end, that's fine. But we're informal. I'm here to give you my insights after doing this with conifers for over 20 years now. I think if you do something every day for 20 years of your life, well, you ought to get smart about something you do that every day. <laughs> so anyway, jump into it. So what is a conifer? A conifer is a Latin name. Thank you is a Latin, yeah, there we go, Latin word for cone bearing. Well, you think about cones, you think about pine cones, and <coughs> most plants do produce cones, most conifers do, firs, spruce, pines. There's also a group that produce a, a kind of a fleshy fruit, if you will, like uh, your yews, your cephalotaxis, your plum yews, podocarpus, things like that. They don't produce a cone per se, but they do produce a plant and they don't have flowers, but rather they have what's called male and female strobili, which as you will see in some of the slides coming up pretty quickly, some of the best colors in the conifers bloom is the, is, is the male and female cones and the new flush. Uh, they're wind pollinated. Just to give you some context with conifers, conifers were here before our modern flowering plants. So you think back in school we studied angiosperms and gymnosperms. Well, conifer is a gymnosperm, which simply means that it produces its seed naked. The ovule is not encased in an ovary, so it's actually a naked seed. Uh, but then through the evolutionary process, insects came along, modern plants came into being, your dogwoods, your maples, daisies, etc. And most of those are all pollinated by insects. But what happens in the spring usually, some in the, in the late fall, is these sacks fill with pollen, the wind blows, the tree shakes a little bit, it releases its pollen. Um, I talked about some having fleshy cones. The leaves are either scale-like, like your uh, chemiciferous, or needle-like, like your conifers. Mostly are evergreen, but some of these do lose their needles. There's five conifers that lose their needles in the fall. Every one of these produces some of the best fall color. You're not going to find a you're not going to find a Japanese maple uh, or Acer rubrum. Any of these things that produce any more interesting color than, than than these five plant groups. And the good news here, where you're living now, where, where I'm standing now, four of the five you can do very well. And these quickly are bald cypress, which is native to the southeast. There's bald lindpine. 
So the ball cypress is one. The meta sequoia or dome redwood is the second one. Uh, larch, which I do not recommend for here. Larch is not a plant really for Charlotte or Atlanta or Raleigh. Uh, Glyptostrobus, which is a plant out of China uh, that you don't see very often. Also called Canton, water pine, but a really kind of a cool tree. And then the, then the uh, I'm drawing a blank all of a sudden. Um, Scott, help me out. Of, Pseudo larch. Huh? Pseudo larch. Oh, pseudo yeah, the golden larch, excuse me, yeah. Uh, which you'll see a picture of the needle on this and for fall color, again, you won't beat this. So, I said they are evolutionary interesting plants. The oldest living organism on Earth, oldest living organism on Earth is a conifer, it's a pine. I just visited these in the White Mountains of California at about 12,000 feet. I have a picture coming up here in the next few slides of that. The Pinus longieva, 5,000 plus years old. I don't think we saw that tree. They don't tell you which one it is, but we did see a number of, of these walking around at 4, 000, out over 4,000 years old. The tallest living organism on Earth is a conifer. The coast redwood going along the coast from about um, you know Monterey and up just into Oregon. It's a plant that hugs the coast, doesn't go but about 30 miles inland. So the tall plant is called the coast redwood. We get that confused sometimes with the largest living organism, Sequoia dendron gigantea, which is the giant sequoia. That's the one you see in the postcards where you can drive your car through. They're on the, on the western slopes of the Sierra Nevada. They're an inland plant. Doesn't do very well here. It's too wet here for those plants. But, so the tallest, the largest, the oldest, and then the tallest tree east of the Mississippi is our eastern white pine. I'll tell you, that was a surprise to me. I didn't really think about that plant uh, being the tallest tree. I was thinking it might be oak, maybe poplar, but it's white pine. So why conifers? Uh, I said they're interesting year-round. Uh, evergreen or deciduous. The bark. My favorite time to garden is in the fall. I mean in the winter. I enjoy being out in the winter. There's, there's no weeds to pull, no grass to mow. It's my time to be out and look at structure, look at, look at fruit on calicarpa and things like this, uh, some of the hollies and you know the conifers, the bark, uh, the colors. Many of these conifers as you'll see actually change colors during the winter. Um, the cones we've talked about, they're botanically fascinating plants. Quite often they're low maintenance. So you think about a plant that's lived for millions of years, it's pretty tough plants to live that long. Uh, again, they add unique colors, textures, and forms to the landscape with infinite applications. So here's the bristle cone pine. These darn things, you may have one branch on there that's living. Uh, but you're talking plants here, 4,000 years old. They grow at such high elevation, there's no insects that really bother them. They grow very slow. They get about five inches of rain a year there, so there's not much growth. The wood is dense. Before you grab this wood, it's not flexible at all. But to walk around these giants and encourage you, if you're out that way, and it doesn't matter what age you are, I don't get around as well as I used to. You can drive right up to these on bus. So uh, this required very minimal hiking. But if you just Googled or got your grandson or someone to Google for you, uh, which I have to do sometime, and uh, Bristol Cone Pine, where they are, but it's a unique place to go in America. I'm going to talk about witch's brooms in a moment, and sometimes people say, now what is a witch's broom? This is a witch's broom. Simply, as you can see, this aberrant growth here on a pine tree, this is a pine, this is actually a witch's broom I found while we were out there in that area on a uh, Pinus contorta, but very short inner nodes, 
and likely caused by an insect, could be a disease, but something caused the DNA in this plant to mutate and to form this aberrant growth, which has its own unique DNA structure. So if you propagated this, and people get quite creative to collect these, because there's a lot of money in doing this. They, they'll take this, graft it, and sell, sell these with thousands. Uh, the way they do that is they vegetatively propagate that. Think about cutting your finger and reproducing you, and you get an exact copy. And if you took seed from this tree, you would not get this. You have to propagate that. But I've seen them take shotguns. I've seen them do all kinds of creative things to get these things out of trees. Um, it, it's you know quite a comedy. But so a lot of conifers come from witches' brooms, particularly pines and spruce and firs, and ginkgo. So some of the early flushes. This is a, a cunning hamia glauca, and you can see the new flush here. It's just this really pretty blue color. Here's your male cones on here. Uh, so this is getting ready to release its pollen. Uh, this tree in our arboretum now is probably close to 40 feet tall. And it's absolutely a form that doesn't shed a lot of limbs, like some of these can shed limbs. But at one time, Cunninghamia was a tree in the south. You can drive over a place like Abbeville, South Carolina, North Augusta, over where Bob McCartney is, your woodlanders. Just some massive trees that have, must be over 100 years old. People were planting these everywhere. As a kid growing up in Alabama, my grandparents lived up in a little rural area, and the old timers called this monkey puzzle. And I know some of you have heard that term, monkey puzzle, which this is not. Monkey puzzle is actually a tree from Chile. So this, this is from China. And the Chinese actually use this for coffins. This is one of the revered woods they use when they're uh, <coughs> being buried because it's so impervious to rot. Uh, but great landscape plant. I was over today to see uh, in David Park at uh, Camellia Forest. He's got some little dwarf ones that probably won't get much higher than this and just spread. So there's all kind of applications for this china fir. Uh, male cones on a uh, Cedrus atlantica or Atlantic cedar. This is native to Morocco, Algeria, and <coughs> North Africa. Again, that's, that's a male cone, not a female. So this is just producing pollen. Uh, you see the interesting color, though, the, on these spurs. Uh, great plant for the south. Does very well here. And by the way, when we talk cedars, we use common names often to describe a plant like eastern red cedar. You've all heard of eastern red cedar. Well, eastern red cedar is a juniper. It's not a juniper, it's not a cedar. All cedars, all true cedars, are native to either the Himalaya or the Mediterranean. So Atlantic white cedar is a coastal plant. That's Chemosephrus thioides. Western red cedar you use for your uh, cedar shakes on roofs. That's actually a thuya or an arbovita. So none of these plants that we, we think of as cedars, they're always something else. Cones again. So we're talking cones right now. This is uh, cones on a, uh, a uh, spruce. And I will tell you the exceptions to the pictures that are not taken either in the south or at our place. I did not take this one in the south. This is a, this is growing. This was growing up in uh, Illinois at a nursery there. But uh, we don't see cones quite that well down south on our spruce. Uh, but we do. You know, these do cone. But you can see how beautiful they are. And before they turn that brown color, they're this wonderful magenta color. So these are in our place. The one on the right here always reminds me when I was growing up, we had these old timey Christmas lights and they'd have the bubbles that would come up. Some of you, I see you remember those. You know, you'd string those things all over your tree and then one light would go out. The whole thing would be messed up. But these are both growing at our place. They're, they're spruce. Both are out of China. Uh, not readily available. One of the questions you're going to invariably ask tonight is, how do we find these things? When I was starting out, it was either at a 
local nursery or lucky enough to come someplace like Plant Delight or somewhere and somebody share those with us. Um, but today the internet has changed the game. It's possible today to get most anything you want through mail order. And I know, I know Tony uses that quite a bit. As I was asking David Park again with Camellia Forest today, I said, where's your biggest sales? It's through the internet. It's not people walking in. So anything you find here that uh, you make a mental note of, you want to ask me later on or now even uh, what this is, most of the plants I have labeled in here. This is going to be about April, March, April, probably probably mid-March to early April. And um, people sometimes ask, how do you tell a fir from a spruce? I'll just mention this real quick. And these here uh, will also go like these. They'll also turn down, but on true firs, the cone is always up. It never turns down. On spruce, they always reflex and go down. Also, on firs, the cone never follows to the ground. Spruce cones follow to the ground. Firs break apart on the tree. And you, you, you'll never see a fir cone on the ground unless a squirrel or something cut it loose. But isn't that attractive? So you've really got not only the uh, the color of the of the needles, you've also got these really cool cones. <coughs> There's another one, Pasea licky against this. This is out of China. So what you're seeing here, you're seeing this is the male cones that have done their thing. Here's your female cones and your new growth. So you really got a lot going on here in this plant. Plus this wonderful blue color. Right at home, it would be right at home here where, where we are uh, tonight. Pines, you know, pines, when I was uh, starting the Arboretum, we took out most of our pines. They were all loblollies, and that's really pretty much all I knew was loblolly pines. And didn't like them. They blew over. Um, not not handsome plants for me anyway. But then I discovered, and I actually discovered this plant here at the J.C. Ross. When J.C. was still living, I came up here and um, to the Southern Plant Conference back then, Tony, when they were doing that here and saw this plant. I'm guessing it's still here, Chris? Yep. It's gotten quite large, I'm sure, now. Very large. I can tell you, I could, I could go out there blindfold and still find it in that border up there. But um, this is a plant from the Himalayas. You, again, you'd be surprised at how well a plant from the Himalayas does. I like, I like the cones on this. It's variegated foliage. It's very lax. Uh, seems impervious to Insects, never had anything bother that. This was not our place, it's now dead. This is A.B.'s Pendro, so this, this plant is not colorized in any way. That's the cones as, it, as, it, as they appeared. A.B.'s Pendro, another Himalayan uh, fir. So I'm going to do a segue and talk about firs for a moment. I'm going to tie this back to uh, Dr. Ralston. There is a fir. It's the only fir that I recommend if you're going to grow the species itself. The only one I think you safely can grow here is A.B.'s firma. And the South owes a great deal of gratitude to Dr. Ralston for introducing that fir. He was solely responsible for finding a heat tolerant fir for the South. So, because unless you're over in Asheville, somewhere very high elevation. <coughs> Knoxville, you're not going to grow fur successfully down in the south. Most of the furs you're going to see, particularly furs from the west coast. Stay away from those. Those furs from the west coast aren't going to live. Here. Again, hot, too hot of nights. We don't have the elevation. Too much rain and soil is not right. So, but this shows you what you can get uh, with the cones. Now, why do I show a plant you can't grow? Because you can grow this plant if it's grafted in rabies firma. I see a lot of, you know, today there's a thing called Facebook. And a lot of us plant nuts out here, we're on Facebook all the time talking, and there was a lot of discussion yesterday going back and forth. 
my wife was driving, Evelyn was driving, and I'm over there talking about furs. And the question was, <laughs> can we grow furs in the South? And the answer is yes, if they're grafted on farm. Well, how do you know they're on farm? Well, I can guarantee you if you go to any garden center, they're not going to be on farm. Unless you go somewhere like a Tony A. Vent or David Parks, who knows what they've got. You could, you could also go to places up here, um, uh, unique plants. They would know. They're incredible places. But your average garden center, the way this works, they build, they got a buyer, and that buyer's buying from the West Coast. And they're just specking plants. And they don't, they don't know. They should know, but they don't know what the understock is. When you're buying most of these conifers in Ginkgo, you're really buying two plants. You're buying what's in the ground, the understock, and you're buying what's on top, which is the plant that you're buying, or you want to see for some, for, for, for some attribute. Well, with furs, I said, you're just rolling the dice out there, and they're going to last about as long as a popsicle out here on the sidewalk in Elkins. <laughs> just aren't going to live. So if you're going to buy, and I recommend you buy them, wonderful little plants. But go somewhere, like, like I mentioned, unique trees is another, I'm not, I'm, uh, not unique. Uh, architectural. 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 Sorry? Architectural. architectural trees, yeah. No, they will know. You know, these are credible places. Uh, I took this over in England. It just, it was so beautiful. But that's Korean fir. Now, just as an aside, we're doing some trials right now. We're trialing, I think, 18 species of, of fir or ABs in our arboretum. Not plants you're going to find, not plants that you're going to grow pretty much, but we are, just like JC was doing way back when, we're looking at other furs out there that may have adaptability. This is one species that we're finding does very well. Nordman's another one from uh, Turkey. Fraser eye. Well, Fraser eye is just up uh, in North Carolina. You know, the, your typical Christmas tree, your Fraser fir. How beautiful those cones are. And that's typical. That's not, that's, again, not a colorized picture. It's not some selected form. It's just a beautiful Fraser fir. So there's numerous dwarf forms. We've talked about cones. Now we'll look at some of the dwarf forms. And just to show you what you can do, I get a lot of visitors. We get a lot of visitors through the Arboretum. A lot of master gardeners, and God bless them, the question always is, how big is it going to get? And my stock answer is, how big do you want it to get? <laughs> do you have pruners? <laughs> Most of this, with a little judicious pruning, you can keep it any size you want. But there's literally plants out there, waterfalls, rock gardens, planters. You're seeing more and more conifers being used in planters. Uh, I know last time I was here a few years ago, out well, in the parking area, there were a number of conifers that you guys had stuck out there and touched. Planters with other plants in there. Wonderful plants. One of the best uses we found, just happened on this, is house plants. Conifers are some of the most undemanding plants for light, other than pines. But a lot of these plants, particularly your tropical conifers, a lot of you have been growing for years. Uh, Norfolk Island pine, which actually the one that they sell is from uh, New Caledonia. It's not Norfolk Island, but it's uh, it's Araucaria. Same genus as monkey puzzle. But conifers make great house plants. Uh, encourage you if you've got a window somewhere. We don't lose conifers in the, in the house. You know we lose Dracenia and things like this occasionally, but. Uh, that's, that's a use that you can think about. And also, we, we use them on our porch and then bring them in in the winter. Um, mixed plantings, talked about that. Shade areas, particularly your hemlocks. People, again, have, I'll get calls or emails or somebody will visit and they want to know, well, I don't have any sun. My yard is mostly shade. And I'll say, well, get hemlocks. They will take the shade, and they're pretty tough plants, and the deer seem to leave them alone where we are. 
The other one that will just work for you great is cephalotaxis or plumbia. In my opinion, the most underutilized conifer in the South for us is cephalotaxis, and there's so many different ones of that. We're also finding uh, Podocarpus. I see a couple on the table up here. I would have thought Podocarpus about last from Savannah, Georgia, which much, much, much warmer than here, would have not survived. We're finding marvelous results with many of the Podocarpus, even a Podocarpus out of Argentina called, uh, um, uh, well, um, too many names in my head right now. Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, but these things uh, just wonderful. They get big, interesting fruit on them. So a couple of dwarf ones in here. There's a little Chemisupras obtusa, JR. As we kind of table through these, think about applications. Think about when, you, when you've gone over to see Tony or David and you've got all these wonderful perennials and hosta and things that they, they sell and how well this would complement those. And, or a rock garden. Um, I'm going to go to a place tomorrow that uh, grows these. Uh, it's a little plant obtusa out of Japan called Chiraman. Uh, I saw these at a nursery and uh, down where we are. I said, where did you get these? They're beautiful. I said, Panther Creek. <laughs> so I called them today and we're going to visit Panther Creek tomorrow and see what they're doing over there. I don't know them. But that's again a wonderful plant. We grow that plant in about half shade. And the deer never bothered it. Seems, seems disease proof. Cryptomeria. You think of cryptomeria, if you know cryptomeria, probably 100% of you may know cryptomeria, but these big, big, you know, big imposing trees that make great screens. Pick the one called Tavarko, Yoshino, or Ben Franklin, some of the big ones. But the Japanese were using these plants hundreds of years before we were a country. And there are so many selections of these. I know, I know David grows this one and has it for sale. But wonderful little plants. That plant is not going to be a space bandit in your yard. Uh, it's going to be well behaved. Um, but look at the color you get. And that color's there pretty much year round. Now, this is more the, the uh, new flush, but you can see even on the inner parts of the plant, it's not green. Another one, another cryptomeria, Komodo dragon. That particular one will came from a nursery in North Carolina called Hawks Ridge, over towards Hickory. Rick Crowder found this plant. He's got a few other introductions. I hadn't hit him up for it yet, but uh, that's just a good little plant. Uh, I don't think I have the one in here Mike Durr found, or wasn't found by Mike, but Mike, Mike's been promoting it. It's called uh, Chapel View. It came from Duke. That's, a, again, a witch's broom and a big tree. Paul Jones may have found, I don't know who found it, but anyway, it was in a huge old tree. They climbed up and actually got the wood, but that's the plant. I'm guessing probably at maturity, four or five feet, probably three feet wide. Tenzin. Well, you can almost walk on this one. It is so dense. And uh, grown in the right spot with, with uh, you wouldn't want to send this to bed wet. You want to keep the water off of it late evening. I water that during the day and the evening. But great, great little plant. Uh, Medicine Quake. A dome redwood. Again, you think of these big, big, monstrous trees that over time and we made the mistake, I made the mistake when we first built the arboretum in our house of planting a dome redwood about 10 feet from the house and now the roots. You know, you know they're, they're as big as an elephant's trunk, you know. Uh, but that's a cool little plant. Again, you're probably talking six, eight feet. At, in maturity. I remember the first time I was at uh, Tony, you know, Tony's place. He did this Ali uh, Minnesota Ogons, or some people call it Gold Rush. The right name is Ogon. Ogon meaning yellow in Japanese. But uh, <clears throat> wonderful Ali of these, of these Ogon Minnesota I thought, what a great application for using those where you've got the space along the drive. This one actually came out of the Netherlands, as a lot of these plants today do. 
If there's one spruce that uh, I recommend for the south, and we do 27 species of spruce, I will tell you, with the, with the exception, with the exception of Alberta spruce, which I think people ought to be, uh, that sell those things ought to be, ought to be taken out and front with, with. Uh, but they're just a spider mite trap, that's all they are, is, um, and there's so many good plants out there to use, but people, I, I see them all the time, you buy them in you know, Walmart or somewhere, stick them out in the pot, they get hot, spider mites get in there and just to in, they look to uh, But Orientalis, this is one called Tom Thumb, great name, see the gold foliage, <coughs> just real tight, not the easiest plant to grow, that one there, uh, folks that have grown it will tell you that's, that can be a challenge. It doesn't want full sun, that's for sure. It burn. Uh, I struggled about leaving this entertaking this for now. Uh, that said, I saw today this most gorgeous Colorado blue spruce here at, at the Ralston. I mean, the color on this is just magnificent. And I remembered you had grown some here, so I left this slide in. Intuitively, I would have thought it's not a great plant for here. We grow it. We do very well. Uh, this one is not at our place here. It is in the south, but um, original plant uh, is growing up in the New York Botanical Garden uh, in, in New York City. Uh, one that we do grow there called Early Cones, and you notice what a precocious coner this is. And again, those cones have got the added benefit of those cones when they're first coming out there, this really dark, shiny purple color against that light blue, aqua blue color there. It's a stunning plant. That plant would grow for you here based on what I've seen. Uh, little pines. Yeah, you don't have to have these big space banded, uh, huge pines in your yard and do something like this. Look at that. That is taken at our place. It still looks, in fact, uh, I have a gentleman with me tonight from Clover, South Carolina, <coughs> just down the road from me, just south of Charlotte. Um, and he grows his plant as well. His actually looks better than ours does. Um, occasionally somebody gets a name, a real cool name on the plant. This looks like a little sea urchin to me. It's again a little white pine. Now here's a new look that's caught <coughs> caught on really in Europe, particularly in Eastern Europe, Czech Republic, Hungary, and places like that. It's called a standard. And what all they've done there is they've taken an understock, they grew the understock up to whatever height, then they grafted at that height whatever they're going to use. So this particular plant was found in Connecticut, uh, growing probably as a broom by a, a guy named Sid Waxman. Tony, you probably remember Sid Waxman from the University of Connecticut, he's dead now. He named that, and um, this is at our place, but I love that little plant. One thing this does, and I don't particularly use these a lot, because I think it can be too cutesy, but one thing it does on some plants is you don't get any soil splash, because there's nothing splashing up on the plant, and you're getting air circulation. So I found with some of these pines that are so dense, it gets hot in July and August, there's no air circulation in there, and these burn up from the inside out. So sometimes getting them on standards like this has help with air circulation. Um, our eastern white pine, again, and our best right off our patio, probably a maturity five, six foot plant with, with pruning, I can keep it outside if I wanted to. Um, Canadensis or Suga, hemlock, coals, prostrate. Marvelous little plants. You know, that doesn't get very big. People worry about the woolly intelligent coming. Well, you could easily control a plant like this. And there's sprays for these that are easy to apply. So you don't have to have this big, big hemlock. Um, that's a full shade plant, or in this case, it's being grown with a, with a, a bit of sun. You notice around there, it looks like back there, don't even know, but now it looks like either canna or hosta growing back in there, but they've got to have a mixed border in here, so they've mixed this in. Um, one of my very favorites, Frosty. So just 
Think about an early spring day when daffodils are coming out and crocus and you're walking out there and you've gone through this long winter and where you're ready to get the catalogs and start ordering stuff. And look out, but here's this bright little plant out there at your feet. This is our place. He's using a waterfall. And um, I may have mentioned I was over at Paul Senior Botanical Garden today, which they've come a long way since my first visit. But one thing they're blessed with there is they got slope. We grow a lot of conifers on this on some slope. We don't have a lot of flat land, but it really helps. But here you're seeing a weeping Deodora cedar, one called Blue Snake. That's just a Deodora that's grown over in some, some Oriental arborvitae in here and what have you. Uh, you see very upright plants, very weeping plants, uh, more full foliage plants growing around. And then in the backdrop, you've got your native trees, your poplar, hickory, oaks. I mentioned containers. There's a, a subdivision over in a town called Duluth, Georgia. That's just the houses in there started a million five and up. Probably not a house in there for under a million five. And they spec conifers. Uh, so every, all of the common areas in the subdivision are conifers. It's quite a unique place. But these are, again, million and a half dollar homes up, and they're using conifers in their containers. Again, it's a little pine. This looks like a Japanese red pine. Oh, with their sedums out here, what have you. Uh, using a weeping hemlock to anchor the corner of the house. Um, again, using a the picture actually was taken up in Connecticut. I just fell in love with the setting here. I think they did a, just a deft job of, of mixing in moss and rock and hemlock and other plants. But uh, again, this is, this is a coldest prostrate uh, hemlock. We wouldn't do these mosses as well, at least where we are. I wouldn't do these mosses as well as we've done here. But you get the idea of what you can do, how you can use these plants <coughs> as fillers to complement, to contrast. See the ferns in here? Another uh, little uh, hemlock, little dwarf hemlock at our place. Cephalotaxis come in all form, shapes. There is literally a cephalotaxis just about rep replication you want. This is a little prostrate form that we got from the New York Botanic Garden. It uh, just kind of hugs the ground. Deer leave it alone. Keeps the same color year round. It's not bothered by anything. Uh, takes trout. Another little form here. <coughs> See how well it's mixing with the fall leaves of the arboretum. So that's going through. One of, one of the things I tell visitors this time of the year when they come, you know, any plant can look good in your garden in the spring. It's just come out and you've got these wonderful leaves and the colors and everything. The way to judge the merit of a plant is look at that tree, be it a dogwood or a redbud, whatever it is. Look at that tree in late September after it's gone through the whole summer in the south and the ups and downs of our rain, our heat, our hot nights, insects, diseases. If you show me a plant that looks this good at that time of the year, you've got a good plant. we got a number of dogwoods and other things out there that uh, we grow. And uh, that's always we got a sweet gum from, from Formosa, you know, formerly Taiwan. I mean, now formerly Formosa, now Taiwan, excuse me, that uh, I've been really hawking to the landscape community. Look at that tree today. It is not a hole in the thing. It doesn't produce any fruit. Wonderful bark. So uh, whether you're looking at a conifer or a deciduous tree, look at that tree this time of year and say, oh, I've got a good plan or I don't. Uh, again, another form of cryptomeria. This again is Komodo dragon. It came from Rick Crowder, Hawks Ridge. Uh, it's like a little, I don't know, a little asparagus or something. Uh, seasons have changed. This is our place. We actually weren't home. We didn't take this picture. Um, I wouldn't have mind being there on, on that day, but uh, we got one of these infrequent snows. Um, 
again, you can see all the slope. But the next slide you're going to see is of this area right over here. You're going to see the contrast from this kind of lifeless look to seeing this with the conifers in a, a normal spring and all this still being deciduous. But what this gives you, here's Linda Silhouette, sweet gum right here, uh, with some cedrus, um, junipers, uh, schemocyphorus, spruce all in here. Here's the uh, weeping ball cypress, Cascade Falls. Um, but it shows you all the myriad forms you can get with these plants. So I was telling you that same same look you saw there, so the trees are still deciduous. And one of my favorite things to do with people that come in the winter, you know, say, now look out. Look at out across the horizon, and you'll see how lifeless the forest is. Now let your eyes come back into the arboretum. And this is an old picture. These trees now, most of them, uh, but you can't really see through here, it's, it's so full. But that colors there year round. And it really complements the water. And so if you say you can't grow conifers in the south, I say too wet. Mm -hmm. Seasons of change, I uh, mentioned winter. This is a pine, this is a Scots, uh, yeah, Scots pine. Pine of Sylvestris, it's called gold coin. Now in the summer, spring, it's as green as any, any, any pine you look at normally. Boy, in the winter, there it is. Just a beacon. You can see this thing for a long way away. Uh, this doesn't do this justice. This is Arborvita. It's a new one called Fire Chief. A lot of you know the old cultivar Rheingold, Rheingold Arborvita. Uh, if you get Fire Chief, you'll throw Ryan go away. That is, it's a patented plant, but it's a great plant. Um, one of those learned to ask for that plant, or if you see it, you got some room, get one. How many of you in the last year have bought a plant with no idea where we're going to put it? You just bought it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm in, I'm in the right group here. <laughs> When I say friends of the Arboretum, yes, I'm among friends. Yeah. We, we're, 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 we're all of the same ilk. Uh, so, when you find these things, sometimes you don't find that plant again. So if you find a good plant and suits your, suits your, it doesn't have to be a conifer, but man, you find something you like, and it may not be there ever again. Uh, so we're coming into spring, you know, seeing it's still, Still kind of lifeless out there, but you see the magnolia getting ready. This is a stellata type. The buds are swelling. But it's not long before spring. Uh, there's a Diodorus cedar. And uh, you'll notice how much bigger these trees are here than they were in that first picture there. that's grown. I find conifers or plants don't read books. And if you're looking at plant labels, oftentimes that, that, that label is based on growing conditions somewhere else. We have a longer growing season here. Things tend to grow a little faster, a little larger, maybe. But again, with judicious pruning. So hemlock, uh, early spring. Uh, this is probably April. Well, not early spring, I guess. But see the new flush. This picture doesn't do this good. It's hard to get this, but. But that is really almost a, a creamy yellow color. It's really bright. That just shows up. And again, the form on that. You see, that's tucked in there with uh, probably Viridis is the uh, is the uh, Acer palmatum in there and a number of other trees. But it just kind of highlights that area. So there we are in the spring. Uh, Big, the big weeping cherry uh, on its own roots. That actually came from seed. Uh, big uh, cypress here out of China, tall plant. You see there's a plant for every application. Now you could use that cypress in a corner of your house, outside. See up here there's a magnolia, a syringiana that's doing its thing. This is a, a cedar of Lebanon, the most mentioned tree in the Bible. Uh, 
you know, Solomon's Temple, um, the little uh, Rich Corleopsis, and uh, yeah, the yeah, Japanese red pine. So now we're getting into still spring. The leaves have come out. If you think about the years you've been gardening or years you've gone through a forest, well, you know, the, our, our forests just light up in the spring. You know, the elms and the poplar and everything are so pretty. And then along about June, things start to settle down and they get kind of dull. Still green. You don't have all that vibrant color that you don't really see here. Uh, and these, uh, these are all, all uh, different forms of bald cypress. This is pond cypress. These are bald cypress. You see, I've taken this one and I, uh, I staked it up to get a good high weeping form. What have you. This is bald cypress here, the species. And what I found also on bald cypress, I talked about this in the book we, we, uh, we wrote, John Ruder, uh, that um, cypress really go faster on dry land. You stick a, you stick a cypress where it grows naturally, and it's much slower growing than it is on, on dry land. And I really think the reason is they don't like competition. So they grow where there's not any competition. Um, and they don't really reproduce from seed unless there's a moist area. They've got to go through a period where that, that seed is really in there where the soil is moist. So it's never going to um, reproduce outside of an area like this, but there's one you don't see in the picture that's probably 10 feet taller than this. The bald cypress, if you got the room, well, they're great. They're, they're a great southern plant. Uh, seasons to change again in spring. We talked about this flush of new color. That's a spruce. That's a Norway spruce. I see an ABs called McConnell's uh, Gold. And um, for about two, two and a half weeks, maybe three, if you're lucky, if you get a cool spring, you've got this wonderful white color. You know, diminu they, you know a diminutive plant there, not real big. Um, this is AB. So this is uh, a fur that's grafted on AB's farm. This is Korean fur. It's called silver lock. Wurzman silver lock. And you'll see a close up of this photo. It's really unique. It really is upturned. Uh, but we've had that plant in the ground. We don't do anything special to it. It just grows. Um, but if you put that on the wrong rootstock, Evelyn and I were in a place the other day, and he was selling these things. $18 for a gallon plant. And they should sell for probably 60 I guarantee you if one of these cats were selling this, it wouldn't be $18. <laughs> and rightfully so. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm drawing the image here though that I told Evelyn, I said, you know what? That's cheap. Well, you're going to get it home. It's, it's that popsicle analogy again. But it's going to be on either balsa fur, which is Canada, northern U.S., or in Fraser, none of which are going to live. So those are the two rootstocks they use. Uh, boy, what a plant if you can get it on front of it. Some of these, some of these folks are growing these now. So here we are now, dead August. You saw this picture earlier. There's a slender silhouette. Well, this is more mature picture. You can see how much things have grown. Um, Sometimes I get lucky, I guess we all get lucky, put something in the right place. This is Cascade Falls, Texodium. And it just looks like a curtain of wood. And uh, behind this, you've got a hill coming back up this way with a lot of conifers in there. But in here, we've got a lot of deciduous magnolias. Not all conifers, there's a few weeping cherries. Um, we've got uh, Esculus briadia, I mean Esculus there, which is horse chestnut, and sort of an aside again, if you're going to grow one of these flowering chestnuts or buckeye, the best one we found is Fort McNair. Briadia is good, Fort McNair, this, that thing just keeps on ticking. Um, um, but that's August. August. Um, Cypress. We don't do enough cypress. This is one, I see this one up here, this label. This is Cupressus glabra. People call this Arizona, but the, all, the, all the Cupressus we see down south, and they come out of Arizona. 
but they come out of an area that gets some rain. Problem with most compressants, like you don't you don't grow the Monterey cypress. Don't waste your money on those cute little Wilma Goldcrest and Donner's Gold. They're, they're, they're going to get a foliar disease four or five years. You've lost the plant and wasted, wasted it. Unless you don't mind losing the plant three or four or five years and you can grow it. But uh, grow these uh, Cupressus glabras. This is one called Raywood's Weeping. Uh, you've got one here you'll see a little bit that Mike Durr found that gets to be big. This is, you can't see it, of course, but this is Sapphire Skies. He found this in an old farmhouse in Madison, Georgia. Him and Bonnie were riding by and saw that. Great color. So Cupressus is one of those plants you really should look at. We've had good luck with Italian cypress, Cupressus sempervirens, really narrow plants. Cryptomeria here, so there's Cryptomeria, there's Cryptomeria, uh, there's Cryptomeria, uh, there's Cryptomeria, uh, let's up with Texas too, there's Cryptomeria, so they're all over the place and they're all forms. Uh, that's a, again one tough plant for you. And I just took an area that was nothing, I just took some old stone at a dry creek bed there and just stuck in conifers. There's a bilia back in there and the uh, number of Calnethus retusus or the uh, Grancy Greybeard, Chinese Grancy Greybeard. So now we're in the fall. Let's see how well they complement fall color. Fall color you see here is mostly the native flora. Serpatio. And David, today we were looking at the your Cashmerianus. That's Cashmerian. Totally different color. Um, so, but see the Japanese maples, various things in here. They just, they work as really good plants. It's kind of speaks for itself. Bless you. So, uh, another great plant, I saw this at David's today, and I'll tell you what, it's, this is a Lispidesa called Little Volcano. Tony, you know that plant? Yeah, we named it. Huh? Yeah, we named it. Oh, you named it? <laughs> <laughs> what was the setup? I knew it. Oh, I knew it. That's cool. Yeah, that came out of Japan. I think it was Shalomichi's nursery. Yeah. And I supported Ted Stevens that we're going to throw this thing away, and he got cutting. But uh, let me tell you, that is one more fine lespedes. You know, people, we get photographers that come in a lot and they're just, you know, play out there, and they always marvel at that. But I'll just stop and just take in the forms in there and the different colors and textures again. You don't see this down south. Uh, Probably one of the closest places, I think, and I'm really, really high on what uh, Joanne does when you dig plants in her place. Tony is another one of those places, and Plant Delights, that just does a great job of, of mixing colors. To me, there's, you know, it's all in the eyes of the beholder, but to me, nothing garish about this. I want to back up. Here's this, uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, there's Sapphire Skies right there. That's one I was pointing out in the table here. So now, as I mentioned at the first of the talk, how these deciduous conifers will rival any plant that uh, you have for fall color. And uh, pretty soon you're welcome to come down. We'll show you around, but we'll start to see these. Uh, and they'll last for a long time. We'll get, we'll get over a month with the color. It's a very slow transition. This is on our bathroom window. Nothing special here. This is a cool picture. One morning I got it. This is just a Deodora cedar that uh, was growing in an area with a lot of shade. You see it went up instead of out. Looking for, looking for light. But this is just native trees and the sun was hitting just right on those native trees. And I thought, what a, what a great frame for a conifer. Don't see that every day. I wish we did. Uh, I mentioned plants changing color. 
This is a hemlock. Again, in the spring, summer, fall, it's just this normal green hemlock. It's a little lighter color than the normal type. Uh, and you're seeing here another, another hemlock. But notice how this thing lights up the shady area. We use a lot of variegated plants, um, a lot of things like uh, Florida sunshine, Elysium, and things like this in our landscape. In fact, there's a Florida sunshine just down the way here. But what a marvelous thing for the fall, I mean the winter. You see how lifeless it is up here. Pseudolarynx, the golden larch, one of your five deciduous conifers. That is a short-lived uh, fall color. We only get about 10 days on this. And it just got, really just seems to drop all at one time. The nice thing is the leaves are so, so small, it doesn't litter the yard. You don't have to rake anything. They quickly dissolve. Uh, but every time I come here, there's a big one that always comes. I don't know if it's coming this time of the year. It would be coming now. But if you're going to be around, go out and look for this. Look out for this plant this time of the year. Notice it's beautiful comes. Metasequoias. Point being here, just the uh, just the metamorphosis of, of color. This is obviously uh, as it's starting to go into senescence, and um, this is a gold form that we grow. This is probably Ogon over here. Unique foliage, Cryptomeria. Oh no, I'm sorry, that's Taxodium. That's a ball cypress. So again, your ball cypress don't have to be these huge. Uh, plants. Uh, this one's out of Germany. Uh, but look at the, all the curves. And probably eight foot plant max. Again, you've got that wonderful fall russet color. Many of the pines, uh, like the Wallichiano Zeguino you saw earlier, but it, it is there year round. Some of these, this time of the year, this is a Japanese black pine called Shiromi Genomi that gets the nice variegation. In, Plant is not going to get real big. There's Sabrina again. You can see the banding on that. There's a unique one here that uh, actually uh, the correct name is Tobabu. Not supposed to be in there now, but uh, it looks like someone spray painted this. A Japanese black pine. But I don't know if, if I've ever seen one with any more unique variegation than this. And this seems to be they love the heat. So the hotter it is, this plant would never look like this in Europe or England. I found this one. Uh, well, I say I found it. I didn't find it. Somebody else found it and gave it to me. But this was found up in North Georgia. Hunted pungens is one of these very underutilized plants. It's called table mountain pine. You'd find this up around uh, West Virginia. It just comes into uh, Georgia. Probably might be in Tennessee, probably is, but it's a unique plant. But this one in the winter time turns this gold color, and I've actually named it Tom's Yellow Hammer. I said I'm going to, I'm going to be vain and name something after myself, so I named it Tom's Yellow Hammer. We sent wood out to Europe and other places. Uh, this is getting around spring. Little bitty cones on this. Like great name Goldilocks plants. Going to get about six feet tall. A little, a little Japanese white pine. Uh, I mentioned Cupressus or Cypress. Um, and you need to see the cone. Looks like a little volleyball. And some of the unique foliage on these. That's their year round. This is actually resin flex. Um, if you were to squeeze it, you'd get a little resin on your hand. But uh, they're, they're, they're just, I'm really high on cypress. Again, more unique foliage. This is a cryptomeria called racin. Every bit of that plant has this twist to it. <coughs> Golden world chemiceparis. Um, probably eight feet. It's these really cool fasciations on there. They call them coxcombs, oftentimes. That's gold foliage. Christo excuse me, Christotta cryptomeria. So 
So here's a silver lock up. She saw it earlier. I said, I'll show you the other folks probably each. What a unique plant. And again, I'm telling you, Tony, do you offer this? No, Tony, I'm going to keep it alive. Have you tried to refer them? <laughs> Huh? Okay. That explains it. Um, we generally think of taxidermy, we think of the bald cypress. There's a whole there's a whole group of these called pond cypress. And pond cypress is a plant that grows more upland or around ponds where the water table tends to be stable, whereas bald cypress, the water table is shifting. And they both produce knees. When they're around water, they don't produce knees. Uh, when they're not around water, but they do produce surface roots. They're not a plant you want to stick in your yard where you're going to mow. But if you've got a field or somewhere out by a pond or just an area that's dry, uh, cypress, fall cypress, a great plant for the south and native. So, again, unique foliage, pines. You don't have to have your old, same old pines. We grow a pine that actually first came from here. It's Pinus teata, which is love lolly. There's, it's, it, uh, uh, I call it NCSU. Um, 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 dwarf, which JC introduced here. And there's a whole area of them out in the Arboretum. And they're just really unique plants. I think they came from the story I remember was it came from the Forest Service. They were runts, and JC managed to acquire them. Chris, keep me honest if that's not a Bryce, if that's not the they were from a witch's broom. Huh? They were from a, a witch's broom. They were um, seedlings from witch's brooms. Okay. And one nursery that I know of produces, and we have one, there's a, there's a nursery in Texas called Doremus Nursery. And it's the only place, as far as I know, in America. We were fortunate about three years to get one of Scott's got one. I uh, got the cloak. And, uh, that's one of my most treasured plants, not because it came from here, not because J.C. had his finger in it. It's treasured because it's a darn nice plant. Ours is about yay big. I don't plan to let it get the size of the yards, but uh, that is a nice plant. The Ramos Nursery in Texas. This is the Oregon Garden in Silverton, Oregon. It's one of the few pictures I put in here that was not the south. One of my real turnoffs when I heard talks, and I heard guys a couple of years ago, he was talking about coming to the, at a conference, and all of his slides were from Oregon. Well, you don't get the same color here. It is, it is, it is kind of false advertising to me to use pictures from Asley Nursery at Boring, Oregon. Uh, they don't look the same. I incorporated this here because this is what we saw in Horticulture Magazine and Fine Gardening and other <coughs> places, and we were led to believe this was unattainable to himself. I mean, I well remember when we started out in the Arboretum. And I traveled, I've been an Army officer. I'd seen these plants in Germany and Maryland, places we'd lived. Um, never thought we could grow this. But you've seen some of the pictures from our place. You've seen them here, other places. You can grow these plants. So you, you might not get exactly this, but you can get pretty darn close. They've done a marvelous job here with this. I, just, I, love, I love that look. Again, that's, that's out of scale for most of your yards. I know that. But it can, it can give you creative ideas to what you can do. And you see also here they burn this up. I like that look. Now, these are, these are some home landscapes. And this is in that million and a half dollar home area where you see how they've used them in here in mixed areas with other plants, walls. Using some thulian here, what have you? Japanese maples. Another one with uh, using Diodora cedar, and then the blue atlas cedar. Looks like a uh, color of Bruce spruce. Probably native pines there. But you now they've done this, and it just just fits right into that landscape. And probably, and I think. I like to think that our book and talks we've done is helping with educate people in the common first. I mean, as I go into the nurseries today, and I'll be seeing more before I leave North Carolina preaching the gospel, I see more and more of this available in the nursery. You've always seen these out with cedars. You've always been around. Theodore is common. Another one using cannas, various things. Maybe 
maybe came a lot first time, I'm not sure what that is, I don't even know. Anyway, you can see where, where they've used uh, some uh, Cypress here, Krypton areas, it looks like uh, probably Craig Marvel, more peddling to fly. Anyway, you get the idea. Scott, is this your yard? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, this is Clover, South Carolina. You tell with that grass. You know, this man just bought a thousand dollar real mower. Which you didn't know that uh, you know, in my day you had to push those darn things to buy yourself a belt. How did you pay for it? Uh, this is back in Duluth, Georgia. Peach, whatever, cherry. Uh, we're back, but we're back home again. This is the entrance to our place. Uh, seasons change. Seasons come, seasons go. Ginkgos. You don't have to have ginkgos. Now, ginkgos are found a lot of times. Witches brew, seedlings. So, take a thousand seeds and throw them out here. You're going to get some variation in those plants. It's like with us. You look around the room, some of us are tall, some are slender, some are more round. And unfortunately, in some cases, people are born deformed. The same thing with plants. Somebody had a very creative comment one time. I, I love this. They said, you know, with, with human beings, when we're kind of odd, we, you know, we maybe are, you know, are born in some way with a deformity or or we don't look quite like normal people, whatever that means, uh, we get uh, we get kind of shut inside. But with plants, they get to go around the world. <laughs> Somebody will find something cool in Japan or in, or in Raleigh, North Carolina, and that thing all of a sudden, it's propagated, propagated, shared, and shared. So they get to travel around the world. So plants have figured out that if they, if they mutate themselves, and they, then, then they get a free trip to Europe, a free trip to China. <laughs> well, this is a ginkgo called Troll. It's a round. Uh, as I travel the nursery trade, ginkgos are becoming one of the hottest plants out there. They haven't quite caught on as much down south yet. But you go to New England, Midwest, Far West, um, and these little ginkgos everywhere. You're going to see a few here. There's one I just got. Uh, Scott and I were up in uh, Michigan, and uh, well, I don't know where this came from, State Street, wherever that is, but notice the unique foliage on that. There is one called tuberformis, but that's, that's very different there. Uh, Saratoga. If I were going to recommend one tall growing ginkgo, Saratoga. You notice the leaf is a whole lot different. And the, and the scalloped leaf that you typically see on the ginkgo. It's very dense. You couldn't see a flank side through this at night. And you're going to have about two weeks of real good fall color like this. And then one day, you walk out there, and magically, it's like somebody flipped a switch. And within a couple of days, they're all, all on the ground. Then you've got this wonderful cart which seems to last longer than the Actual fall color. And it just doesn't work. Here is this deciduous tree with all this cool form to it. And then this curtain, it's almost like you drew a, a line with a string and it just falls down. That's, it's just quite romantic. All right, so variegation. A very number of variegated forms, the problem is finding them to be stable. I have not yet got one that's totally stable. There are better forms out there. This is Majestic Butterfly, which is a bit, you know, of where I've been. Look at the look of that. Yeah, you know, with some pruning and taking out the green stuff, uh, excuse the stuff, the, the green wood, but even here you can see a piece of uh, non-variegated, uh, so they're tough, but they're, we've got one growing in our, just off our, our breezeway, I look at it every morning when I go outside. And, about half of it's variegated and half of it's not. It ain't half bad. Just <laughs> <laughs> um, little forms off. So I'm going to go back. Look at the leaf 
on this one, the leaf shape, the leaf shape, and notice on this one, I want to just walk over, excuse me for doing this, but you look at that leaf, and that leaf, and that leaf, it's almost like sassafras, where you get all these myriad forms, the three different forms, primarily on, on, on sassafras. There's just a lot going on there. If you want something you could just look at and four season plan, just kind of oogle over, the geckos are a pretty good ticket. They're not conifers, by the way. They are gymnosperms. They do bear their seed naked, but their reproductive cycle is different than, than uh, conifers. These plants were around before conifers ever went on earth. Uh, so cycads, things like that, those were the early plants that the dinosaurs were around. Uh, so again, that leaf, dwarf form, that was a witch's broom. That's American, that was found in the Netherlands. Um, how tight that is, and how the water's hanging on those leaves. Now, those are starting to turn really butterscotch yellow right now. And even, even in the winter with the buds on there, they're just cool plants. You can see where that one's uh, grafted in here. That's uh, one called Troll again. Uh, a lot of nurseries, particularly in Tennessee, he had just got a commercial nursery. That actually is where that one came from. Uh, just, just congested foliage. So, kind of come full circle. The motivation for this book, you know, as Tony would tell you, you don't get rich writing books. But the motivation not to sound corny, but there is no book out there for the South on conifers and geek. You know, you can search around and find a little bulletin here or somebody wrote something for Southern Nursing Association. There was never a book. And the frustrating thing to me was when I was starting out with this, I couldn't find couldn't find anything. And we always think about a plant. When you, when you go to a nursery, the first thing I guarantee you, one thing you, know, you look at is you look at that tag, and it says zone zone six through eight. And you never look at the high number. You're always looking at the low number, and intuitively you're asking, you know, you're processing, it will live through our winter. Most of these things and a lot of things that you'd find at plant life other places, it's not the cold that knocks them out. It's the heat. The, uh, there's a thing called the heat index map, which was produced by the American Horticultural Society. I encourage you to look, look this thing up. With conifers and ginkgo and there's a lot of other plants, it is, it is the heat, not we lose more conifers in August. And I was talking, I said I was in Birmingham Botanical Garden last week, and the curator or the director of Birmingham Botanical Garden said, we lose more conifers in September because we put away the hoses, not doing anything, and uh, we're not concerned about that. We're concerned about the cold. You're an interesting state, uh, more ways than one. one uh, this is a horticulture in Mecca. There's probably not five states that I know in Northern America that have the horticultural history and the number of great institutions and nurseries that you've got here in the state. From Asheville all the way. I don't know much about the coast. This is about as far as I've gone. I go to Tarboro sometime. There's Greenleaf Nursery there, which is wholesale. We couldn't get in the pocket. Anyway, uh, you're an interesting state also because normally in most states, you always think, the heat zones, north and south orientation. You go to Alabama, it's Mobile, it's Birmingham, it's Huntsville, you know, uh, Miami, Orlando, Gainesville, Georgia, you know, Savannah, Atlanta, North Georgia. Well, here you got this east-west thing going on, because you're a narrow state, you're not too high. So, you know, what you can grow in Asheville is different than what you can grow in Charlotte. You're in the Piedmont here versus what you can grow on the coast. All of these areas present unique challenges, unique soil types, unique elevations. Nights are different. 
So um, learn to think about heat terms. Um, plants don't get a chance to, a lot of them don't get a chance to rest at night. That's why, back to the firs, these firs from the west coast, they don't get a lot of moisture. This may surprise you. We get more rain in Atlanta than in Portland or Seattle. We just get it in big gulps. Theirs is more gradual. It struck me when I went to uh, Oregon the first time. Portland doesn't get any rain at all from about May to the fall. You talk about a dry place. Uh, yeah, they grow some stuff. Now they irrigate. But if they do, it's just real dry. So we're different here. A zone six or zone a zone seven in Raleigh is not the same zone zone seven as in Washington State. So never think about well when I'm looking at that tag and I'm saying zone seven, well zone seven where? Um, so if you look at where a plant comes from, its origins, which is where I got the idea for these spurs. I started looking around the world, where do these things grow? What's the, what's the rain patterns there? What's the elevations? What likely might succeed here? Um, this is one of the last things I'm going to talk about is, is uh, this is going to surprise you, but we, we've had many experts in there, many, many of the real heavy hitters from the agricultural world and all over the world come in. They've all said the same thing. Okay. Um, you have more conifer species here than probably any other place in America. Now, that's a, think about that. More than Oregon, more than Michigan, more than, more than Pennsylvania, more than Connecticut. Well, see, we can pull all these things up, and a lot of this you can do. We can pull all these things up out of the southern areas. Mexico. Mexico will surprise you at the elevation. If you've never been to Mexico or studied Mexico, Mexico has mountains much higher than Mount Mitchell, which is our highest point east of the Mississippi. They got mountains in Mexico three times higher than Mount Mitchell. You go along those spines of the Sierra Madres there, the Oriental and the Oxental, and it's, it's amazing what grows there that will come here. I remember seeing First time I came here with J.C. and was looking at these quercus or oaks, he was bringing them from Mexico. Uh, Polymorph, lysophyllum. And had no idea how this stuff would grow. So all this to make the point, you really are in a garden mecca. Yeah, there's some things you can't grow, but there's a hell of a lot more that you can grow than you can't grow. And you can grow more here than they can grow in Oregon. It's just sometimes you know you can't grow. Um, I think that's the only things I wanted to cover with you. Now, I would love to have a whole bunch of questions. We get some light sometimes. And I would love to get as many questions as you want to ask. And I'll try and answer. Yes, ma'am. Can you talk a little bit about uh, soil preparation? Great question, soil preparation. And it's, you know, it's funny, last week I had this question in Birmingham, and I was thinking, I don't, I don't really amend the soil, which I don't. Well, last week I was planting a few things, and I'm digging, and I hit some of the worst soil. And I think you, most of you look like you've probably gardened enough, and you can tell when you dig in, and you've got this messy clay that just doesn't break apart, it's not friable at all. You can tell that versus soil has got some humus, some content in it. As a general rule, we don't uh, amend the soil. I did last week only because I knew where I was going to put these plants. And I got out and it's back-breaking work. That is thankless work. It's digging a hole and you've got to find a place to take all that stuff and dump it and then bring in. And, what I've been bringing in, we got, we're blessed, we have a creek close to our place, and we've got to it a few times, and we got a pond, you saw the pond. So we bring in, uh, I'll just go out and shovel bucket loads of, uh, of uh, this river sand. It's got enough humus in there, it works very well. But, so, to drill down to your specific question, unless you've got just miserable soil that's not going to break apart at all, 
what I do is when I dig that hole, I will mix in a handful of lime and slow release fertilizer at the same time. I'll just mix it in with the soil. I don't use a lot of nitrogen the first year because I don't I want to grow roots. I don't want to grow plant. Uh, because everything starts everything starts with your soil. I was impressed today again at Senior. I made that comment today. They had good soil. You've got good soil here. I've seen this soil. <clears throat> your gardening starts with your soil. If you don't have good soil, okay, what kind of plant is, how adaptable it is, it's not going to work real well. Second thing is mulch. Mulch, mulch, mulch. Keep your mulch away. Don't do mulch volcanoes around your plant. Keep your mulch about this far away from the root of the plant. But mulch, okay, what you use. We use whatever we get, but mostly composted wood chips where the crews will come in, they'll dump it, and we'll let it age for six, eight months, and then we'll just bring that out around there. But sometimes, uh, you know, a chipper for leaves uh, does two things. You know, it, it, it avoids soil splash, keeps the weeds down, and it also keeps your soil cool. And then the organic matter. We find, you know, I go in there and I can find worms in there about jillions. Um, and uh, they irrigate the soil. And, you know, worm castings are also um, giving you some um, organic material back. Um, the last thing is um, um, to water. For the first couple of years, I wouldn't say we baby them. But about every 10 days to two weeks, I go out there and turn it up in the hose where I can stand there. And actually, I find it kind of it's boring, but it's kind of therapeutic in a way. You just walk around with a hose, and we've got hose bibs out of the yard and, um, just What are the plants? This gives me a chance to look at them, study them, and see if there's any insects on there. Uh, in the book, we do talk about insects. I noticed today it was over again at, at the center, and they have some of these two needle, three needle pines, and they get a little, a little larvae, soft fly larvae, and they'll eat the heck out of your two needle, the three needle pines. You gotta be careful with that. A little seven will take care of that. But I hope I answered your question on the, on the amendment. <coughs> uh, in that same vein, um, nurseries aren't gonna like this always, but I won't buy a plant out, get the root ball out and looking at the root ball. If that plant is really pot bound, a lot of these plants, they'll come out of, this is one of the dirty little secrets sometimes, they'll come out of Oregon and they call it beak grade because that plant is set there, it didn't sell, whatever reason, it's set there in that pot and it's just the roots are just entangled and, they'll, and, then, and then they'll offer that to a nursery here on here in southeast or northeast or midwest, I still do, and they'll call it a beak grade plant. Plant looks good, but you get it out of the pot, you've got this mess. When I've had those, what I always do is day one, I want those roots touching native soil. Another reason not to amend the soil is I think I think roots can be a little bit lazy. And when they're in something to their liking, where you've amended it, they're not going to want to go out there into the other maybe harsh harsher soil and, 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 and spread. So I want those roots day one touching what they're going to grow in for the rest of their lives for a long time. Uh, so I'll take that plant if it's really root bound and I'll put it in a pail of water or sometimes just throw it out there in the pond and let it sit for three, four, I'll let it sit there half a day. And it does two things. It gets that plant real turgid, it gets the, so, you, so you've got water is all up in all the cells. But it also allows me to get in there then and I want to get as much of that planting media out of there as possible. A lot of the West Coast nurseries use Douglas fir, which doesn't break down real well for us. And I think it does create some pathogen problems. Douglas fir does great on the West Coast. And a lot of times, because of the different conditions out there, they'll ship these plants in very narrow containers and not a lot of roots. It's narrow. Well, they ship it narrow so they get more on the truck. Um, but 
Don't be afraid to take that plant and abuse those roots. Get them, get those roots day one. Whether I don't care what kind of plant it is, get those roots flared out when they're touching the soil. So, other questions? You said you had you still have a question. Did I answer everything you wanted? Well, I was going to ask you if the Cox Arboretum is irrigated, and you pretty much answered that. Uh, yes and no. Okay. Uh, about a third of it is irrigated. And um, part of it's not, again, I water it. I'll, I'll get a bunch of sprinklers out there or something. I water it. I don't, I don't just let things go. So, many, so much of the stuff is rare, and it's not going to come my way again. So we're not growing just those little cute plants you saw here. We're growing a lot of rare stuff. And, and it, you know, comes along once in your lifetime. Um, but um, we do irrigate. We try to do, we irrigate every other day for about 20 minutes per zone. And we, we're pulling out of a pond, like pond water. Uh, another thing I found for us is uh, our soil is very magnesium deficient. Epsom salt, very cheap way. I was talking with a lady tonight. Um, that had a, yeah, there you are, yeah. Jan, right? Yes, very good. Good. And uh, she, had, she had a uh, plant and was worried about some discoloration. Uh, some of that sometimes it's just a magnesium deficiency that, that's showing up as yellowing of the plant. You go into nurseries sometimes, you see these plants, it looks like, well, you see this U or something, and well, it's golden U, and all what it is is the plant's chlorotic. <laughs> you get it home, you know, in a couple of years, you get it growing right. Fertilizer, when do you fertilize? I don't fertilize, I fertilize my hardwood trees in the fall and the spring. Going into the winter, I want those hardwood that I want to grow, the maples, dogwood, etc. And dog, maples aren't a heavy feeder, but red buds, dogwood. I'll feed those in the fall. And when the spring comes, it's loaded up with vitamins, so to speak. And when it's time for that to, to initiate cambium activity, it's ready. It's loaded up with vitamins. Uh, conifers, I don't do that in the fall. I just do that in the spring. I try to do it twice. I use 10, 10, 10, cheapest I can find. I don't go out there and buy this real, uh, real expensive I will try. I do keep some around when I first put a plant in the ground. Again, low on nitrogen, um, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, anything else? Yes, sir. Can you name off five, six, whatever you will, nurseries, mail order nurseries that you think would be mm -hmm. good? That'd be helpful. I do. Yes. Connor for Kingdom, for Connor, Connor for Kingdom is absolutely one of the best. I'm going to recycle to the last. Oh. That's a different presentation, That's unfortunately. Okay. I did have one. That's okay. No problem. Um, it was just a bench there, and if y'all come sit a while. Well, y'all do come sit a while. But uh, so, uh, Connor for Kingdom. Uh, for plants in general, I, uh, uh, you, know, you know, for conifers, um, uh, Broken Era Nursery up in Hamden, Connecticut. Broken Era. Broken Era. Um, haven't been to Tony's in a while, but I'm sure he's got a list of things over there. I know David today. David does a little bit. He's got some cool stuff. Um, but outside the trace of North Carolina, um, those are the two, two that I think are most. Isley Nursery is not mail order, but here's another thing you can do. I'm glad you brought that up. Everything you bring up is a, is a, is a seed for something else to talk about. I know you all want to go home sometime tonight. So. But I'll get off these tangents in a minute. But um, with uh, with your local nurseries, here's what I had to do: is I will find we have a place called Buck Jones. Buck Jones is nothing but a rehab site. You want a plant? They bring these plants in, and their market is the landscape, primarily landscape market. So they're buying it at a certain price as a landscape, or the trade price, if you will. And then you got walk-up customers. Well, you can go in there and you can say, I saw this Cryptomeria Komodo Dragon, Tom Cox gave a talk on that. And next time you order, and they can go on the internet and they can find those plants. A lot of them use Isley Nursery, which is the big boy 
that's ISCLA. Osley Nursery is probably the, the number one conifer nursery in America. Huge, huge place. Um, but but it's for strike the trade up a relationship. It's for the trade only, though. No, oh. no, no. You can go in there yourself okay. as a, as an individual. And what they're going to do is they're going to buy it at their price. They're going to pay this. They're going to pay to bring it on their truck. They normally bring a full truckload. And a lot of these nurseries, like around here, some little mom and pop like Joanne over at Unique Plants, she'll probably piggyback from somebody else. Probably David is not bringing a whole truckload in. I'm sure he's not, he's not big enough from uh, Oregon. So. They're going to make stops along the way. And these nurseries are not going to have a problem. I recommend you meet the manager. Develop a relationship with that manager. Not, not the salesperson. Or the buyer. Two people you want to meet. Either the, either, the, either the guy that runs the place, the owner, or the manager. Preferably the owner. Uh, if he or she knows what they're doing. But the buyer is the person that generally is the one out there. And that's a different person. Unless they're real, like David is small enough, David is the buyer, but, you know, slash owner. Probably the same with the buddy over here. Um, uh, Scott, what else am I missing there? Uh, there's something I'd like to add that Tom's taught me over the years is just the importance of networking. Meet as many people as you can because they will open doors to other people. As you get more and more into the collecting conifers, you start wanting more rare plants and stuff that this area out there. Build your network, because like I said, you meet one person, they might know where to be able to get, you know, know somebody that can get you that next plant. So that's it's a good point. Super and important you, I think. And you've got I've always envied the Syrian. I don't I don't say that to to sound like I'm buttering you up or anything. I've always envied this area because you had these wonderful nurseries around here and you had this great network of gardeners. We don't have this where I live. I wish we did. We've got master gardeners, we've got passionate people, but they're, it's different. I think, I think, Tony, you know that. You've been around the block a whole bunch of times out there. Um, so, uh, Scott is right. You know, the internet today, email, Facebook, uh, and maybe you find something. That young man was out in the woods and he found, uh, there's a, the one spruce native to our area is red spruce, but see a ribbons. He found a witch's broom on a red spruce. Well, that put him on the map like you wouldn't believe because all these collectors in the Netherlands and Japan and all over America want that plant. And they're willing to give him something or some things for wood. All he's going to do is go find and get cutting. He's going to send out to some nursery to graft. He's not. He doesn't have the expertise or the time or set up to do it. So networking is important. Uh, the American Conifer Society, and I'd be remiss not mentioning that. I am not a joiner. I'm an only child, content to be out there in the garden by myself. I've got the right profession because I need to be by myself all day and be as happy as a pig is, you know, in slop. But. Um, <laughs> Uh, I love that society. It's good people, wouldn't you say? I mean, they are. They're good people uh, and helpful and uh, share with you. Uh, I was up in Michigan the other day. It was, was a funny story. I, I'm coming home with all these plants in a duffel bag. And plants, so many plants are sticking out of my duffel bag. Somebody stopped me at the airport and I says, hey, buddy. He says, you've been here too long. I said, what do you mean? He says, you got plants growing out of your suitcase. <laughs> Listen, uh, I know that we're getting late into the evening. I do have the book for sale. I'd be glad to autograph it. It's $30. Uh, but I would also be remiss in not welcoming you down to the Cox Arboretum and let us show you around. Um, done a lot down there, and as you have here. So I'll be over here. If any other questions before we sign off. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom.